Welcome into the 218th episode of the Young Terps podcast, starting off in the Viner Four Gates Zoom room, then over to the Viner Four Gates studio. We are talking about the Terps lost to Ohio State, Maryland, now ranked in men's basketball. And as always, our leadoff hitter, as his uh, voicemail message says, Todd Carton with the non-rev report. Todd, up and down week for our Terps across uh, a handful of sports and uh, the sad end to a couple of seasons for our fall Terps. Yeah, absolutely, Mason. Unfortunately, uh, two Terps in t- teams in the NCAA in their respective NCAA tournaments, and both fell short of their ultimate goals. And we'll get to that. You want to? Yeah, start we'll get with, to that right now. We can start. You want to start with uh, the men's soccer team? Sure, so we sure were- can. And it was the team that I was really pulling for. Really thought had a chance to make a deep run. Uh, that came to the end to an end on Sunday, but before uh, that, the Terps did win a tournament game this year. Their home game at Ludwig Field, Maryland, a un uh, a team without a seed this year. They topped Fairleigh Dickinson five to two. Uh, the Terps got it going early and often. Todd, yeah, I mean, you know, came out they scored I, in the first within the first two minutes. I think it was Stefan Capetti, then Malcolm Johnson scored about eight or 10 minutes later. And then uh, Albie Andrenica, a freshman making his first appearance, just a a back heel pass that was so good that Fairleigh Dickinson's coach in his press press game said, if I hadn't been coaching Fairleigh Dickinson, I'd have applauded that pass. Yeah, and that's always a a big nod of approval from your opponents. Uh, The Terps led 3 nothing at the half and led uh, themselves to a five to two win. As I mentioned Sunday's game against the number 14 seeded Cornell, big red um, Todd. It's always tough going up to New York this time of year. Temperatures in the single digits, snow coming down on the field and um, a and rough end to the turf season. Yeah, it was pretty windy too. Uh, it was cold. It was blustery. And honestly, Cornell had much the better of it. I was hoping, you know, there was a a Maryland Cornell game that played in the spring that had a happier result for Terps fans back on Memorial Day weekend, as you may recall. Uh, And I was hoping for a similar result, particularly since I think the team felt a little disrespected, not getting a seed and not being at home themselves. Um, But the the field was tilted in Cornell's uh, direction most of the first half. Uh, Nicholas Neumann was great in goal, kept the Terps in it, held the Cornell uh, scoreless, made four saves. Uh, Cornell finally broke through late in the game in uh, the 84th minute, I think. And uh, they scored again a couple minutes later. Terps were down by two. Uh, they did get a late goal again from uh, a fr- the freshman, Andrenica. And... Um, could not get, uh, couldn't capitalize. They got a, did have a corner kick with about two minutes to go, and they couldn't capitalize on it and finish the season with a record of 11, four, and five. Yeah, and it just did not amount to much for the Terps in the postseason. They don't win the Big Ten tournament, and they fall, as Todd just mentioned, to the number 14 seeded Cornell team. Wraps up uh, another successful campaign for Sasho and crew. Would just love to see another. Uh, run deep into the NCAA tournament, but uh, the Terps will have next year. And it looks like they found themselves a bit of a star freshman going into next year. Yeah. And hopefully they'll have Josh Bulma will come back and he'll be a junior and, you know, and they have some other young, young players. Capetti is fairly young is I think a young, younger guy. And so, you know, there, there is, there's a nucleus there, but the the Terps are going to have to find more ways of finishing They're They're, they were up and down with that. They'd score in bursts sometimes, like the game against Virginia, the game against uh, Fairleigh Dickinson. And then they'd have games where, like, like they did Sunday, where they barely got any shots on goal and, and only wound up with one goal, which not quite enough to get them over the top. Todd, now I think over to our main up and down team of the week, uh, the Terps Volleyball. Another uh, top five win for the crew, but it's followed up by, well, more of the same that we've seen. Yeah, um, boy, Friday Friday night was was pretty spectacular. Um, the the Terps were playing Ohio State, uh, who they would f- play in football the next day, and the the Buckeyes came in 
at 15 and one. They had won, I think, 15 straight in the Big Ten. And uh, the Terps knocked them off their perch with a tre- tremendous effort in, in four sets. They, they really dominated the Buckeyes. And it was interesting because in the same way that the football team kind of got punched in the mouth on Ohio State's first drive and Ohio State went down the field and scored seven, scored a touchdown in about a, three minutes uh, like they were practicing, uh, the Buckeyes came out in the first set and just absolutely dominated Maryland. Coach Hughes made some adjustments in his personnel in the second half, uh, in the second set, I'm sorry. And the Terps came back and just took control of that match. They did everything right. They passed well. They served well. They put Ohio State under pressure on their serve. They blocked well. Everything you wanted to do. Hughes made the right moves as a coach. Everything you wanted to do, and they absolutely crushed Ohio State. They went in the next day to play a Michigan team that had uh, had to actually travel into College Park. And, and Michigan played like that for the first part of the first set. Um, and Maryland continued their momentum from the Ohio State match. And then somewhere in the middle of that first set, uh, the Terps were, were up, I think, uh, 22 to 15. And then things started going sideways. Yeah, and Todd, it just doesn't happen for Maryland. Uh, they drop set after set against Michigan, and they fall uh, to the Wolverines. And you would just love to see yeah. this team be able to pick up some back-to-back wins this year, especially when they knock off top five opponents. But uh, you know, it doesn't happen, and uh, the finish to the season not not much easier. No, well, you know, I mean, you you have to give some props to the team and to, and to the coaching staff. Second top five win in two seasons they have two top 10 with at least Purdue was top 10 when they played them the first time uh the Terps are now six and 12 certainly no hope of a postseason at this point um they will host Purdue who's currently ranked 19th uh Wednesday night the night before Thanksgiving uh game will be at seven o'clock and then uh, they travel out to Indiana who's actually playing very well Indiana actually knocked off Ohio State the night after Maryland did. So Indiana is Steve Ayer, the former Maryland coach has Indiana kind of looking like a potential bubble team. Um, I don't think they've done quite enough to get in, but they're, they could be if depending on, they'll have a lot to play for. They could have a lot to play for when Maryland travels out there on Friday and plays them at five o'clock. I know that I use international time with you, Mason, but don't want to confuse our listeners. I'm, I'm comfortable with international time or military time as some folks call it. So both those games you'll find on BTN Plus. Oh, of course. Of course. A long unpaid sponsor, BTN Plus. Todd, on to field hockey. Um, and I think this was our shot at a championship for the fall season, but the Terps fall just short. Uh, they reached the Final Four for the second consecutive season, fourth time in the last six years. And um, after splitting the two previous games, like we talked about in the last podcast, against Northwestern, Maryland season ends against the defending champs uh, by another score of two to one. And it was scoreless all the way to the fourth quarter. Yeah, really. It was, I mean, it, uh, just into the near the beginning of the fourth quarter, about three minutes in uh, Benta Bockers, who is probably the big scoring star for Northwestern uh, was able to convert on a penalty corner and Maryland couldn't quite get the equalizer with a couple minutes to go. Missy Maharg, pulled the goalie, which is not unusual in field hockey late in the game. And you get that extra field player and you're hoping that you'll be able to create some pressure as, as for example, Rutgers did against Maryland several weeks ago. And Maryland had a kind of a, a tough turnover in the middle of the field that led to a very easily open net goal for, for Northwestern uh, with a, with under two minutes to play. And then a near miracle happened. Yeah, Todd, Emma DeBerdine scores with 113 left for the Terps. And they then earn a pair of penalty corners in the game's final 37 seconds. But they were not able to knock in the tying goal. And the Terps uh, leave Soros, Connecticut, without the chance to bring home another national title, which would have been their first since 2011. Maryland finishes the season 19 and four great year for the Terps. They played an impossibly hard schedule 
and uh, North in the Carolina. Best com- in the best uh, field hockey conference in the country without question. Oh, by far. And, but and- our old folks from the ACC did win the championship. North Carolina finishes, was it a perfect season? A perfect season. They were undefeated. Yeah. Let, and they so they uh, beat Northwestern in the final, uh, also two to one. Uh, and just so folks who are listening who might not know what the big advantage is in field hockey on a penalty corner that unlike, say, a corner kick in soccer where everybody sort of crowds into the box in in field hockey with a penalty corner, the offensive team, you can only score from inside a, a, a 20 meter, a 10 meter arc. And as many offensive players can be along that arc as the offensive team wants, but the defensive team only has the goalie plus four. So they're always outnumbered. So it is a great chance to score if you can convert, but it's uh, a, a great defending team can defend those as well. And it's a little harder to control. It's also difficult to control the ball. So uh, Maryland did have have two great chances uh, in the last 37 seconds that to maybe push the game into overtime, but uh, fell just short. Yeah, so North Carolina uh, adds another championship to their belt. Uh, they were also the champions in 2020, weren't they? Uh, North Carolina had actually, yes, they, they were champions, I think, two or three straight years in 19, 20, 20 uh, Wildcats uh, last year, but 18, maybe 18, 19, 20, North Carolina had won, I don't know, 45 or 50 in a row at one point. They were really, really dominant for a couple of years. Yeah, so North Carolina takes it home. Terps uh, wrap up 19 and four on the year, and that wraps up our field hockey coverage uh, for this season, uh, Todd now up to a team that had a pretty, pretty solid week. Brenda Freeze's squad uh, wins both their games this week. Yeah, started out at home on a Wednesday morning. It was field trip day that Brenda tried. The best day uh, on campus in College Park. <laughs> not if you're inside the Xbox, Mason. Not inside the Xbox. When you got 6,000 kids who are who, who take that screaming thing literally and ice cream for ice cream. And, you know, those those of us who are a little older like to have the earplugs on those for that particular game. Uh, but, you know, uh, Davidson was kind of pesky. They hung around, hung around. Uh, Maryland eventually put them away. They had 30 turnovers, though. It was a real problem for them. And that actually obviously helped Davidson stay in the game. But they, they managed to uh, pick up a... a what from a distance looks like a fairly comfortable 18 point win 70 to 52 and the terps rolled on down to waco on sunday afternoon for a matchup with the 17th ranked baylor bears and todd not the cleanest game by maryland but a win over baylor on the road is a win over baylor on the road terp 73 baylor 68 yeah, uh, you know, and and the 73 points for Maryland is is actually pretty darn impressive, uh, it, given that I, in their previous games this year, I don't think Baylor had given up more than 55. So, you know, that that was a that's a great scoring outburst. Again, Maryland gave up a lot of offensive rebounds to the Bears, who are not a big team like South Carolina was. They're the size of the teams, Maryland and Baylor, kind of comparable. And uh Again, turnovers, 19 turnovers, not great. They started out with a couple of early, early turnovers. Um, but, uh, you know, Diamond Miller, who was named uh, Player of the Week in the Big Ten, had a career scoring day, 32 points, and grabbed 10 rebounds. And Abby Myers was able to join in the transfer from Princeton. And I think your alma mater, or she, are you a Whitman? No, nope. no. I'm a Wooten, Todd. Wooten. Oh, I'm sorry, Mason, of uh, deep, deepest apologies. Um, so Abby, Abby Myers picked up 13 and 10, and uh, that's her first double-double as a Terp. Yeah, and that's going to be probably of many this year, the way that she's been playing, Todd. And uh, the Terps, on, are they got to get the team rebounding going. They need to gel as a team with so many new players, but a big win uh, as Brenda Fries is putting together what, I think uh, could be a team that kind of flies under the radar this year and can definitely do some damage uh, in tournament play with their size and speed on the court. 
Yeah, it's certainly possible, Mason. You know, I, but they do have to have to overcome. They're going to like the men's team, who uh, I'm sure you'll talk about later and how phenomenal their performance was over the weekend and picking up the two wins over St. Louis and uh, uh, Miami. I, I think when they when Maryland finally faces some of the big bruising teams with big inside players in the Big Ten, that'll be a real challenge. As South Carolina, with its size, challenge really was a challenge for Maryland. Maryland has a lot of uh, wing length, but no real inside length. So that that is going to be a problem. They're going to have to work hard, rebound as a team, work hard on their technique and boxing out. And, um, you know, so they'll get going again. It doesn't really get hard, get challenging for Maryland until after Thanksgiving. They do have a trip to Florida over Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah, a nice place for the Terps to spend Thanksgiving weekend. They'll play three morning games in four days at the Fort Myers. Tip-off, uh, Terps opened up with DePaul at 11 on Friday. DePaul's 2-2 two and two coming into this with wins over American and Miami. A uh, high-scoring team, they average 89 points per game. The game can be seen on Fox Sports 2, so no, no more BTN Plus to- plugs for us, Todd, here. Uh, they'll take on Towson in Fort Myers, led by first-year coach Laura Harper, uh, the former Terp great. Tigers are 2-0, and and then they travel, um, or they'll take on our longtime ACC rival, Todd, your favorite line, Maryland's yes. longtime ACC rival, uh, the Pitt Panthers will come in. Pitt 4-0 uh, and o coming into it. Uh, one common opponent between the two is George Mason. Both teams uh, beat up. George Mason, pretty good. Pitt by 18. Uh, the Terps uh, by 37. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of those one, was, one was in one was in Pittsburgh, the and one was at George Mason. So we'll see we'll see how that that matchup goes. You know, but c- props to Laura Harper. She was coaching at uh, Coppin State last year, and she actually I think was coach of the year in the MIAC. Yes, she was. Ha- before Towson hired her away, hired her away, and so well, nice to see her moving up the ranks. And it's a little disappointing that Coppin State no longer has two Terp alums coaching their basketball team with just one. And the uh, folks can see them the day after Thanksgiving as Juan Dixon will bring his Eagles into the Xbox. Yeah, and we'll see how long the one that's remaining at Coppin uh, stays at Coppin. <laughs> a lot of drama around that program at the moment. Yeah, Todd, always love it when you get to travel down to Fort Myers, Florida and take on Towson, you know. Yeah, that's really kind of interesting and and even more interesting this year because Fort Myers was, you know, frankly so devastated by the hurricane uh, just, a, you know, six weeks ago or so, and yet they're going to manage to put this tournament on. Yeah, great news that they still have it down there uh, in Fort Myers. Wrapping things up with wrestling, Todd, this wrestling squad is um, continuing to build, coming off the t- Tiger Style Invitational. Uh, they traveled over to Pitt, mentioning again the longtime ACC rival of our Maryland Terps, the Pitt Panthers. Uh, the 16th ranked Pitt, uh, surprised by the Terps of the Big Ten. Maryland flex against Big Ten muscles with its first uh, ranked dual meet win over. Uh, a ranked squad since 2013. So we've had a lot of opportunities between 2013 and now, but uh, Alex Clemson's got the boys um, doing great things on the mat. Yeah, Mason, I have to say, and I may have said this on the previous podcast, I went to one match. They had three duels on a Saturday uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I and I went to that one, to one of the three matches. And to my less than expert eye, I could immediately see that this was a team that was in physically better condition and technically just much better wrestlers than they had been, which is not surprising because Kerry McCoy was a heavyweight and heavyweights wrestle very differently from all the other weight classes. It probably should not have been, uh, you got to be careful if you're going to have a heavyweight as your head coach. Kerry was one of the best guys around but uh, just really struggled as the head coach. Another thing about this pit match that I think exemplifies, because sometimes you wonder how a a sport that is so individualized can function as a team event. 
And this pit match for Maryland epitomized that in that they split the 10 matches in the 10 weight classes, five and five, but Maryland got bonus points with a fall in the very first match that started them off, gave them a six, nothing lead. You know, you get three points for a decision, four points for a major five points for a tech fall. And then six points for, if you pin your opponent, as they call it a fall. And then Pitt has two guys who are ranked first and eighth in the country. And I'm thinking that they probably went into that Maryland match thinking that they would get some bonus points and Maryland's wrestlers at those weight classes were able to contain them and keep them to simple decisions. And that really contributes with the fall to Maryland's overall victory came down to the last match. The Terps trailed 16 to 15 going into the final match with uh, Jerron Smith, who it feels like has been at Maryland for, for a decade. I think he's actually in somehow in his eighth year. So he, I call him the elder statesman of Maryland wrestling. He really is uh, kind of a man out there. And, um, you know, he had a comfortable decision and put the Terps over the top. Yeah, big win for Maryland. Eight years, Todd? Yeah, I think so. I think I heard someone say at, at one of the matches that he was in his somehow, and with the COVID year, and he had an injury red shirt, and I don't know, he red shirted as a regular red shirt his first year, and I don't know how he got past seven, but someone I told me he's in his eighth year. So, but it's the only at least way that seven. works is with a medical red shirt, but which is possible, but. Uh, that's a long time. He closes out for the Terps, who again take down the number thirteen right, or number sixteen ranked Pitt Panthers. Who, who frankly, I, I should add, went on the uh, the next night on Saturday, which it kind of eased the volleyball win and the pit w and the wrestling win Friday night. Kind of was part of that yo-yo that we were talking about. The down of the loss in field hockey Friday afternoon became the up of the two big upsets and Pitt went on to beat number 11 Lehigh who's uh, coached by uh, former Maryland coach Pat Santoro he went back to his alma mater a number of years ago and had that program Lehigh was ranked 11th in the country so it was not a fluke it was not a fluke win for Maryland and the Terps roll on uh, to their next beat which is December 11th at Navy so Terps with a little bit of break here for Thanksgiving uh, most teams uh, do take one with the Terps women's basketball team back in action right after it. Volleyball back in action. And we say goodbye to field hockey and soccer on the non-rev report. And Todd, uh, thanks for joining. Thanks for a great fall sports season. We'll roll on uh, as the winter sports pick up. And soon we'll be talking about softball, baseball, lacrosse, uh, our spring well, first, first, getting we'll into, be uh, first we'll be talking about gymnastics because they'll get started uh, late December, maybe early January. And they'll, that'll be the next one that we add. And we'll continue to keep you posted on how the Terps non-revs are doing on the non-rev report. Todd, thanks for joining tonight. The wait is finally over. DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbooks app, is finally live here in Maryland. Now we can all legally bet on our favorite sports with DraftKings anytime and anywhere right here in Maryland as well as the rest of the DMV. For a limited time, new customers who sign up with promo code YOUNGTERPS will receive $200 in free bets instantly. Uh, the Terps taking on Rutgers this week and Coppin State, Maryland, a 12-and-a-half-point favorite over the Scarlet Knights as of Wednesday. DraftKings has the best features in all of sports, including parlays, player props, easy payouts, all at your fingertips on the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Download DraftKings Sportsbook now. Use promo code YOUNGTERPS to get $200 in free bets instantly when you place a $5 bet on anything. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with our promo code YOUNGTURF. Please play responsibly. For help, visit mdgambling.org or call 1-800-GAMBLER. You must be 21 years or older, physically present in Maryland. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Bonus issued as free bets. See DraftKings.com backslash Maryland for full terms and conditions. Now we welcome in Wayne Viner to the show. I guess some we go... Uh, one or two more of these for the season. Well, we're going to have uh, this one after Ohio State. Uh, we'll have one after Rutgers. We'll have one after we figure out what bowl game it is, and we'll have one probably after the bowl game or maybe one or two at the bowl game. But, yeah, this is winding down, and then it's going to become all basketball until it turns into lacrosse, and we just roll on. The seasons never stop 
with the Maryland Terrapins. No, they don't. Terps dropped this one uh, better than we thought. If you played it on DraftKings, Maryland plus 27 and a half, or uh, especially the Terps. Uh, oh, the what, first what half. It? Yeah, plus 19 and a half, was it? I, I can't remember. No, but, but that would still would have been an interesting play. I brought that up saying this is a kind of game that if you could stay in it, maybe. If you're in it at halftime, maybe you got a, a, a chance here. But there was a pretty good chance until we got there, until we actually got on the field. We were like, man, we could lose this game by a lot. And then something happened, and we talked about it on the postgame show, where you, you turned to me, we were standing in the Gossett end zone, and you said, man, these guys, this is different. These guys are fired up. Yeah, I did, and and – you know, when you spend a lot of time around college teams and below pro sports, it's a little bit different. Those guys generally are, are much more prepared to meet moments uh, than, than college players. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. They are just just a different mindset, a different way about the way they prepare, the way they get themselves ready to go. With Maryland over the years, I've found myself being able to, if I'm on the field before a game, if I'm shooting a game or taking video or w- whatever the day's um, mission is, you can usually get a really good sense of how ready Maryland is to play any given game. And on the field on Saturday, there was a clear change in the readiness, in the atmosphere, in the feeling that was there before the game. And last year, before they played Penn State, it was similar. And they hung around in that game till really the very end, and they they lost that one, thirty-one to fourteen. Just just couldn't just couldn't finish drives. Saturday, I mean, the final is forty-three to thirty. Really, Maryland loses the game thirty-six to thirty. But yeah, it, yes, pretty much. But for those who don't know, and I'm sure if you're listening to this show, you probably know. But if you don't, generally we shoot photos. The photos often can be seen on Terp Talk after the game or they're part of the post-game show. So we stand between the end zone and the Gossett team house. There isn't that much room down there. So when Maryland's warming up, they're warming up literally right in front of you. Uh, offensive and defensive lines are, are right there. There's nothing hidden. So that feeling, that interaction, you don't need to be at midfield to get this. You can get it exactly from standing on the back of the end zone. And you were more perceptive about this than I was but one thing's for sure Maryland didn't really back up they got in this game they stayed in this game they Ohio State's bigger they're faster once again repeating what I said on Saturday night my goodness they are big and they are fast and they are strong that is an absolutely elite team and yes if Maryland and even though Maryland looks more like a Big Ten team now especially when they go out there and they play heavy, and we'll talk about that when they play with Burns and a tight end, a fullback and a tight end. Oh, that state's just huge. And uh, it would have been an upset. Absolutely would have been an upset. It was a bit of an upset to be in the game. The ball was on our racket. 40 seconds to go. And, yeah, in the NFL, it might be easier to get down the field. Seen a lot of games lately where it looks like it's over for somebody, and boom, 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 they're down the field, and they're thrown to the end zone once or twice before it was over. And, yeah, I thought at halftime we talked about this could be this could be the one that we're after. This certainly was progress. If you want to mark progress, leading Ohio State at halftime, especially after being quite awful the past two weeks at Wisconsin and at Penn State, come back and lead Ohio State, um, it was big progress. But to have a shot to win the game, and Loxy didn't go into this, as much, and, and neither did we, that, wow, we actually had a chance to win the game because Leah got sacked twice and fumble intercepted, and, and it cost him seven more points, and the game's over. It's 43. But in a different world, a different time, yeah, Leah marches you down the field and has a shot to throw the ball in the end zone. Whether or not you catch the ball, that's almost enough for the movie for me. And I know we're not supposed to be happy that you came close, but that would have been a heck of a thrill to get the ball to the 40 or 35 Ohio State and the last play of the game you throw the ball to the end zone. 
I'm not saying you're going to catch it or not, but in the movie version, you see the ball landing, and you see a Maryland guy jump up, and the movie fades to black, because not as important that you won the game, it's as important that you were there, and that you could show that you could play at this level. Now, my version of the movie is you catch the ball, and it's the biggest celebration you've ever seen in your life. Well, we've gotten to that point with these guys. We really have. You can cut the movie when Piggy opens his hips to throw that ball to Sean Jones in the end zone. Um... Yeah, I think you take steps forward, you take steps backwards. That's what building a, a sports team is. Yeah. And by the way, that that was Wayne as a fan. Wayne as a football analyst. Come on, you were in the game. You got to win the game. the The point is not to make a beautiful movie out of this. The point is to no, win the game. No, it's not. And look, there's a lot of things that led to Maryland not winning this game. A lot of things that they've done throughout the season uh, that lead this team to be what I take as a disappointing 6-5 and five instead of a team that should probably be 8-3 and three right now. Okay. I, I know one of those wins is Purdue. Is the other one Wisconsin? Yeah, it, it is. And the meeting the moment is something we've talked about a but, lot. Before you go into your psychological analytics here, if you could come back and say 8-3, and three, they were in the game at Michigan – and they had the ball with a chance to win the game against Ohio State, and the and they, uh, Penn State game just didn't work out. But if those were your three losses, boy, the, my goodness, what a difference that is. You'd say we're a couple of possessions away from being in the playoff. In the playoff. Yeah. Yeah. But but we're not. The no, Maryland you're Terpins not. Are not. And, 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 and that's why I'm not really into the speculation thing. Yeah, but that's what makes – if you're not, then there's not a whole lot to this show. Here's what happened. We lost. Thanks for coming. Well, there is, and I disagree with that. I don't really think people listen to this show to hear about speculation. But, look, you, you got to be ready to play. And, and in this game, I think Maryland was, for the most part, ready to play. I think they had a good game plan offensively. I think they had a good play game plan defensively. What I have circled on my notes in this is after the game, Loxley said that the players came to him or he has a meeting on Monday and this week he decided to let the players do a lot of the talking and they basically told him they haven't been practicing hard enough, preparing well enough, doing doing the things that they were asked to do to win this. In that same line, he said, I decided this week to put my best 11 guys on the field and go man against man against one of the best teams in the country, and all I asked is that my guy showed me effort. That line right there has been what we have said on this show week in and week out, I feel like, since week one of the season. I, I as, as a football analyst, am saying, why the hell are your best 11 guys not on the field almost every single play of the game? The fan version of me says this team should have won eight or nine games this year because our best 11 guys can clearly play the game of football very well. And, and we've done that twice this year against Michigan and against Ohio State, and we almost beat both of them. True. And then the person who's still paying for season tickets in 206 says, why am I paying a premium price and paying for parking, paying the Terrapin Club, if you're now telling me you didn't have the best players on the field? I, I mean... But that was in the moment. I'm not sure if you could use that 100% against him. But, yeah, that's what we've said before, which if you have NFL-level guys at wide receiver, why aren't they getting the ball Well, here's more? my question for you. How many times in this game did we see Corey Coley Jr. at cornerback? Zippo. How many times did we see Lionel Whitaker playing corner? None. How many times... Combined snaps did Shalik Knotts, Octavian Smith, Leron Husbands, Leon Houghton. Um, and I'll even throw Ramon Brown in there to get you up to six. Yeah, Five or ten? Six. No, uh, well, yeah. There's a fair amount of Ramon Brown in there. All right, unfair. How many times did they rotate the guard or the center during the game? I think the actual answer was zero. Zero, because that's the stuff I watch. So leaving Ramon Brown out of this. The number of plays that they gave, number of snaps that they gave to people that might not be in your top 11, was darn close to zero. 
The only guy that might not be in your top 11, but once again they went heavy, was Burns at fullback, and he got a handful of snaps out there. But they were trying to change the culture, trying to get heavier, and trying to take Ohio State on, and they needed a bigger guy out there. So he got some snaps that Deitches wouldn't have gotten, but that was 100% by play design. That wasn't on a snap count. They weren't just trying to rotate him in there. So I think they did a lot better job. Why they didn't do it before, I don't know. That's sort of been a central theme of, of this show is why, when the game's on the line, they have guys that aren't the number ones out there. And hey, it worked on Saturday. They played their ones the whole way, and it worked. They played their ones. Yeah, Gavin Gibson got out there a few times. I think Gavin Gibson's played his way into that. But just a few times. And Glenn uh, Miller was out there just a few times. Just a few times. Glendon Miller, just a few times. And most of the snaps, even if you go into linebackers, it was Gote, Hippolyte, and those are the guys that rotate. Barham does not rotate, but he's out no, there the whole Ahmed time. No, Ahmed McCullough was also out there. I mean, it was... But that was limited. It's those three guys. They played a handful of guys up at the defensive line, but fewer than they had played before. Maybe part of it was the temperature. Or maybe it was the moment, but whatever they were doing, it worked. Well, whatever they were doing, they were clearly the guys that belonged on the field on Saturday. Going through, I mean, a lot of players caught the ball for Maryland. Demas has the most catches for Maryland. Followed by Rakim Jarrett, or uh, my mistake, followed by Jacob Copeland and Roman Hemby and C.J. Dupre. Um, Jarrett, Felton, Octavian Smith gets one catch, Corey Dyke just has a catch. So still, you know, 10 guys catch the ball, but just the target numbers. Copeland, four catches. I'm almost certain that's near a season high. Demas, four catches. I mean, the ball was clearly going to the guys that that can make the impact, and that's just what I've been asking for. They They played the game plan that I was actually looking for them to play the entire season. They were throwing the ball deep. They threw 50-50 balls to our guys, and you know what? Our guys caught the ball. And sure, there's a game where our guys don't catch the ball, and the three of those are interceptions or w- whatever happens. Have, haven't but, really seen that game. But the simple ask was, if you want to go out there and you want to market that we have a fantastic quarterback, the best group of receivers in the country, it's supposed to be one of the most competitive offensives that can keep you in any game, you have to go out there and run play sets that feature those guys. And on Saturday, they definitely did that. They did that. And when they needed a yard, most of the time they got the yard. When they needed a fourth down play, they got it a lot of times. And when they needed their quarterback to make a big play or to have a, uh, a big throw, For hell, the we most judged part, him enough on this. He, he was did there. It. He did it. 59 minutes of primetime Leah. He actually took off and ran the ball couple times aggressively made a decision he took off he didn't wait he didn't double look around and and just see what was going he took off that guy making those decisions can play at that level but you need to play with that fearlessness and maybe the fact that maybe somewhere in your head you're like I can't win so I'm just gonna let it go I'm just gonna play I don't have time to think he got chased out of that pocket on fourth down and I, I feel like I've seen this so many times and the guy catches him not on Saturday. And those were big bean dudes chasing him. And he ran away, kept his composure, and threw a pass that A, only his guy could catch, and B, his guy came through and caught it. And then they had the sack to go back and go for two, which was, so what in the world are you doing? And they run a great play. Colvin catches the ball. He gets a two-point conversion. And all of a sudden, we got ourselves a game, and we got ourselves a season, and Maryland didn't back down. They gave up 17 points in a row to start the second half and then they fought back so whatever whether you like Loxley you don't like Loxley when you go well these guys quit not on Saturday they didn't they came back with a vengeance and if that play and I know the ball hit the ground on that interception that wasn't an interception but there's a moment like that that you needed to swing this game Yeah, and and they didn't get it Trader dropped one and the Banks one was, well, the ball was yeah, clearly on the ground yeah. uh, when Bo Braid was trying to make a play. I, I think that that does. That was the third quarter, by the way. 
What? No, that was the second quarter. Second quarter? Yeah, Maryland scored the best video I've taken of this year, which was C.J. Dupree's uh, touchdown catch Mm -hmm. in the corner after he made a fantastic uh, defensive play. You know, a lot of people thought he would end up being a linebacker. Really? That guy's an NFL tight end. Yeah, 100% NFL tight end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when after the game, and you know if you haven't seen the post game stuff, please take a look at it on Turp Talk. Uh, talk to him was on camera. I said you you had the high hurdle of the game. And, well, hold on. Before that, he already answered that question in the open interviews. So he gave you a really short answer. He actually gave the person that asked it, asked it before you a better answer. I, I was hanging out with Jacory and Bennett, so I showed up late. Yeah. Before, he said, in high school, he wasn't allowed to do that, and he used to get a bunch of penalties for jumping over people. Because everybody would try and hit him on the knee, and he didn't want to get hit on the knee, so he would jump over them. So it was illegal in high school, so he didn't get to do it. And he's made a name for himself as the guy on this team that likes to jump over people. He can jump over people. I will say it again because it's so impressive. That guy's an NFL tight end. I think both Deitchus and Dupree play on Sundays. Yeah, I would agree with you. Deitchus might end up being a slot receiver. I don't know about slot, but he could definitely play outside wide receiver. Um, Look, overall, it was a really, really good game day experience. I mean, the tailgates were there. Of course, Ohio State brought their 17,000, 18,000 fans with them that are usually there. Um, Maryland's fans just, um, you know, and I don't blame anybody, didn't really show up. Well, did the not students, have our most. Well, CJ did say that he felt like he had the crowd behind him. I think they did. I mean, clearly to me, others online have said differently. There were a lot of road fans there, but there were more Maryland fans than there were. There were more state. Maryland fans, but you know, if you had sat, so part of the game we went up and, and just to fan experience did not stay on the game on the field the whole game. Up there, a lot of Ohio State fans, and they were more vocal than the Maryland fans on the field. With the student section, the band facing us, spent, or right behind us, depending on which end zone you're in, it it felt more like a Maryland crowd. In the stands, it felt a little more like Ohio State. They were just louder, and they had you know their OHIO chant that would break out. Maryland just doesn't have one of those. So well, Maryland does have one of those now. Suddenly, again, we've decided to ban the song that unites our fans. The Hay song, but they did break it out with what a minute to go. They, they, they kept that under wraps for 50-something minutes. You know, I don't know who, and I almost hope this person's listening to the show because there's a lot of good fan experience ideas that have been thrown out on here. Who was in charge of the music? But one, I think they did a really good job. It was the best scoreboard performance because the scoreboard's been a damn disaster. Well, the, the, the numbers don't work. You go up there and you look, and they got the same numbers you had in the first quarter, and go, oh, the software, our $7 million scoreboard has bad software. Uh, somebody better update the drivers in the offseason. That's a good joke. Viner Forgates can help you update drivers. We can. That. That, if you want a widescreen TV, we have one over in College Park. We can get you one for home use. Yeah. Um, but overall, I think they brought it together. They played you know, music that ignites the fan base. But the, the entire time, I'm thinking, you know, I actually tweeted it. Play the song, you cowards. Like, this is our game. It's on national television. It gets our fan base energized. You should play that song, and then when the offense comes out and they play the tequila song, they should play that every time the offense comes out. Like, it's just, you know, the simple things that make it a fun place to go to the game that other schools just have. We have them, too, except... Our athletic director of the past decided to ban one of those things that brings Maryland fans together. And our guys just can't seem to get, get it right. Doing things repetitively with fans to engage them in the game right. at a yeah. school that's not naturally a football school just makes too much sense. Well, that's, I, I didn't know we'd be talking about this, but sure, let's go look at the basketball experience where you know what's going to happen every time out. And some people are like, well, i got to go to the bathroom. But I want to see the timeout, so I'll go during the game. So I get the flag timeout at the basketball game, or I get the the Maryland Pride timeout at the basketball game because the timeouts are set, and and Maryland fans, I guess, more of a basketball school than a football school, they know people who go to these games all the time know what happens at what timeout, and they played the same music 
for the past 10 years for each one of these things. Whether you think the music's outdated or not, they made it a Maryland tradition. We just need somebody like, I don't know, we'll, we'll use you as an example again, to go there that says football's important to me. I, I am going to get these timeouts right. We got the first one right, the first quarter. We go with the flag timeout. But we need something for the third quarter that actually sticks. So when you go, well, we the, have the, you know, it, it, they should play the hate. They should do something around the hay song. At the end of the third quarter, the whole place stands up and yells, "We're going to beat the hell out of you and you and you and you!" And the place goes crazy. And the fourth quarter starts. It isn't I mean, it, that hard. Th- that's a good one. The other thing is like we played Virginia Tech in the bowl game last year, and they had that stupid that that song. Time and time and yeah. time again. The Hey song should be our song that then just annoys the hell out of anybody that comes to College Park to see a game. Okay, well, that's... but it goes it goes back kind of to my next point, which is at some point, and I think they've actually instilled the fear in, of course, the best team in the conference. I almost think that. Ohio State, there's a lot of guys from Maryland that almost beat Ohio State. There's a lot of guys from Ohio State that almost lost to Maryland. That belief that we can and that you're going to come in here and, damn it, we're going to give you everything that we have. <laughs> this is my thing. You're stealing my thing. Is But I think it comes from the fact that when everything was down for Maryland, they had five wins, they had two chances to get to a bowl game. They were playing at home against Ohio State at Penn State. When everything came down to it, these guys truly believed that they could beat Ohio State because they almost did. And the next time they come back here, it might not be next year when we have to go there. The next time they come back here, whenever that may be, our belief, if it's within these guys' career or or the recruits that were there, anybody that was there to see it, the belief that we can against this team is there. I believe the chant is, I believe that we can win. We will win, but... Well, we haven't done it yet, so I believe we can win. I, When you talk about Loxley and the evolution, and, and you were brilliant on the post-game show talking about how the, the players see this and the changing from a place that might lose to a place that might win, that the default is we're going to win as opposed to, oh, my God, we're going to lose, and that, that takes longer than the fan base wants to give it. Not but, always. But I would like the outcome of this to be and, and, and maybe it's it's on the come here where we're getting there that when you say you're going to play in college park whether you're michigan or ohio state or penn state or whoever you are and one day it'll be ucla and usc and oregon and whomever else is coming you go you know what over the past couple of years it's hard to win there it's what we had in basketball that's what you're looking for the number one team goes to maryland they're, they're gonna, gonna lose, lose. They're gonna lose. yeah yeah, so you said before, this is probably a year or two ago, you know, Purdue does that. Purdue's not the greatest football team you've ever seen, but when they faced with a number one, number five opponent at home, pretty good chance they're going to win a game. They're not going to win all of them, but they're going to win a game. And I don't really think that that needs to be the goal going down the list of things that are left and we're already 25 minutes into this part of the Well, it's, it's a goal that I want. No, but, no, but it's, that, that's not – Maryland's goal in the sense like Purdue it's Purdue you know their story is written for the moment kind of thing they had great players they certainly had they have a lot of NFL quarterbacks a lot of NFL guys Bob Greasy Drew Brees and... yeah Curtis Painter David Blau you know okay. David Aiden Blau O'Connell didn't will be the same thing as yep. David Blau um is did just that belief that you know Ross Aid Stadium on a Saturday night and it is a tough place to play. I mean, everybody wears black. It's a nonstop blackout game there. And you have to go in there and you have to want to win. I feel like right now where our program is in terms of step-by-step step getting better is going back to what you said, it goes from, holy shit, we're going to lose. This is the best team in the country. To, I got some dogs and maybe we can win, which is, I think, where we were in the past. To, like, where we were on Saturday. We're winning this game at halftime. And we're celebrating on the way to the locker room. Big no-no. Oh yeah, you we don't saw do that. that. We were standing there as the they went in. The minute you do that, you're, everybody's looking at that that knows anything. You're like, ah, oh, yeah. shit, yeah. we're gonna lose. And I turned to you and went, oh man, I don't want to see that. And then it has to be that I believe that we will win, not that we can win, but that we, damn it, are going to win this game. 
because I, as a player that's on the field, refuse to lose. And I feel like our best 11 guys have that attitude. I don't know what is in the minds of a lot of these guys that may even be walk-ons on the staff, graduate assistants that were here before, in the before time. But I do know something now. And I was questioned in my belief of it, you know, last week and the week before, of what is actually going on here, is we're a handful of guys away in terms of more mindset than skill on the field, while Ohio State, these guys are massive. I mean, they're the best of the best. They're top-tier talent year over year over year. No, we're not getting that. We're getting something close. We're not getting a 6'8", 360-pound right tackle that literally pushed a play over that ended up being a touchdown for Ohio State, just came behind the play and just ran the whole yeah. thing over. God, that was impressive. I mean, that guy is just a freak athlete. So, so, we don't have those guys. But upstairs, you know, in your head when you're playing the yeah. game, the guy's six eight, whatever. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Give my it to coaches, me. My belief that the coaches have prepared us to play the game well yeah. enough, and if I do my job, which is what I was talking about last week, if I do my job, that my impact on the game, whether it shows up on the stat sheet or not, whether I'm the guy they're featuring on ABC during the broadcast or not, I know that I'm doing my part as I'm on the field to set the edge. I'm on the field to retrace the play. And, we, I'm on, and I know that, and I'm committed to that, and I don't need to make the biggest play today. When you look at who the coaches have been, I know that Randy Etzel was looking to recruit guys that might have been, not been the greatest football players, but almost to a person, the guy was either the captain of the wrestling team. He was the captain of the special teams, and he was the captain of the football team. He was looking for those guys mm-hmm. because when you say that, and Loxley has said this, I think every coach says, I want that leadership to come from the locker room. It's not, I'm not out there playing the game. I can get you ready. You guys have to go do it. That we need a few more of the guys that maybe they weren't the greatest players in the world, but, yeah, they were the captain of something. Well, And I, you can trust yeah. that they are would rather, this isn't not literal, rather die than lose. Well, there are two people that I know that have been very, very successful college athletes. One of which is at TCU now. The other one is at UC, U, USC now, who was at Ohio State, playing football. And, and they're both, they both start on two, I guess now, top ten teams. The commitment and the mindset of those guys from high school, whether it was like fall ball lacrosse that we were playing or, you know, literal, you know, top, clearly top tier athletes, you could just tell the mindset, the competitiveness, the, the whole thing was different with those guys because they were bought into the idea of being a Division One athlete. Now, to get to this point, and football is a little bit different in the sense, like if you're like 6'4", 330, and you play decently and you're just, you know, you play Montgomery County, Maryland football, like Marcus Bradley, the guy that Maryland was after. He's sitting in the middle. Chop Robinson's on one edge. Some guy that's on North Carolina's on the other edge now. The guy's just eating it up. You know, he's a defensive tackle. He's playing against Wooten and Walter Johnson on Friday nights. You know, he's going to get four sacks and ten tackles for loss, and and he's going to have games like that because yeah. everybody's worried. Three got three v three. Their three man rush is better than somebody has five man offensive line. So in some ways, it's a little bit easier, and in some ways, that's where we're lacking. Is Getting those guys that have that mindset is something that when I look at the class that Maryland has now compared to the ones where they brought in guys like Brandon Jennings, Terrence Lewis, who may have had every skill in the world, but just don't have that commitment to playing football at this level and keeping themselves out of trouble off the field and the whole bit with that. The mix of guys that you need to establish a culture and then just flat out ballers is different because, you know, look at a guy like Stefan Diggs. He's still arguing with Sean McDermott when, you know, the game wasn't going the right way. He's not getting the ball. He has no targets, no catches. But it's the ability to get over that, like Stefan did on Sunday. Ends up four catches, not his best game, like five catches for 60 yards and a touchdown. You got to have the team around it that says, you can be angry that you're not playing, generally defensive back or wide receiver, but you're not going to affect the rest of the team. You're still going to do your job. You're still going to run the scout team. And you know what? You will play. And Loxley talks about partnership with the athletes. A lot of the partnership has to be, dude, do you want to win or do you want to play? Because certainly I think TCU is a great example of it. I think Baylor's competitiveness over the past couple of years is a great example of it. I think Alabama is a great example of it. Guys are going to leave. But you can't put up with that shit. You can't put up with the all for me. Example, Texas A&M. 
So, well, well, you mentioned that NIL might might bring this problem. Well, it might gotta, bring just doom to college athletics. It's yeah. going to be you know freshman on freshman. Yeah, you're you're getting paid to lose, but that that's not exactly what you're talking about. No, I'm talking about how you go through these the players that you want to that show interest in coming here, and how you pick out you know how you evaluate basically talent over mindset. And how you get a good mix of those two things, because you certainly need both of them. Not every guy that's got the best mindset that was on the wrestling team or that really loves playing football is going to end up producing for you if they're a two-star. But is that guy that sticks around for five or six years better than the four-star that you pull off the street? No, doesn't it's, act it's right part of the and, fabric. It's part of yeah. the fabric of winning, because you talked about the game and, and you know, different background here. I'm talking about showing up to practice. I, I would talked about going to practice as a seventh grader the other day. And getting in the game, and they go, just do what you do. Yeah. You don't need to score. You don't need the shots. You go rebound, play defense. You you do you, and we'll worry about the rest. We need guys like that, and, and hopefully the, the, you will end up with a good mix of people who have the character and the willingness in practice, on the sidelines, in the game, the whole mix of it, to bring the level of I just won't quit up just a little bit in College Park. Yeah, so two quick things on the game this coming week. I think the biggest one, I can't believe we haven't talked about it yet, is do you think Leah plays? Yes. I think Leah plays because, well, let me let me wind that back a little bit. He hurt his knee, said he got driven into the ground, and when we walked back, because we had gone to about midfield, hoping Maryland was going to get to midfield, so we want to be a little bit ahead of the play, and he got sacked behind us. And when we got back to the end zone, he's laying there almost in the same spot. And it came to be a little later that Demas was, you know, I've seen this before. It was Demas laying there against Iowa a year and a half ago or so. And there's Leah, and they're looking at his knee, and we're going, oh, boy, th- this is bad. But he limps off the field. What you probably didn't see is after the game, they carried him off the field. He, he couldn't walk to the locker room. They picked him up. Uh, your boy uh, Ryan Davis and somebody mm-hmm. else pick him up and carry him in the locker room. At that point, you know, you got Billy Edwards in a boot. Eric Najarian took the last snap. And I'm thinking, well, I guess Lee is done for the moment. And now he's listed as the guy that's going to come out and talk to the media on Tuesday. So if he's going to come out there and talk to the media, my thought is he's probably going to play. And maybe that was just a bruise. Yeah, well, you would hope that um, maybe Najarian gets a chance at a revenge game. Yeah, that revenge game. He stepped in in that shortened season, six-game season or so, for uh, Lance Lejean and almost beats Rutgers. What, what was the score of that one? 27-24. Fatu Kasi, the guy that's playing for the Jets now, playing defensive line. Really beat Merrill. Jake Funk ended up getting hurt in that game at 100 I just looked 180 yards before he got hurt on 17 wow. carries. So and um, so you know Rutgers is four and seven. They're out now. They went to a bowl last year with five wins. Yeah, not going to happen. Probably not going to happen this well, it's year. More or less not going to happen because ESPN's already attempting to quote unquote make bowl games up for the teams that won six games or more because it's looking like there's too many six win teams this year because there's so many mediocre teams. Too many six win teams yet. I believe once we go back and count it after Saturday, upcoming Saturday, the Big Ten probably does not fill all of their ball slots. They do. They do fill them. Exactly. It's either 9 out of 10 or they really only have – it's something like they have two option bowls um, and then eight set bowl games. And they're going to fill – the eight set bowl games they will fill – and then, depending on who goes to the playoff or not, which at this point it's almost certain the Big Ten gets one team, they're going to end up. They're not going to get any of their option bowls, unless the option bowl games want like the teams that the Big Ten has. But that gets all into the way the contracts written and all that stuff. So, Rutgers, Maryland. I, I think that Maryland still has a little more weight on this. They really do want that seventh win, and I hope they find a way to to bottle that want to that was on the field against Ohio State and come out and stay in that mode. Clearly, they're going to a bowl one way or the other. If they finish 6-6, six and six, it's going to be a huge disappointment. But, look, you like to say it's 7-5, and five, and then you're going to win your bowl game, and you're going to get to 8-5. and five. And 8-5 and five is progress no matter how you cut it. Hey, three games over 500 is better than one. 
which is yeah. what you were last year. And you just continue to step forward. And that's the thing. When you look at this roster, they're going to lose a yeah. lot. But there's a lot of time to talk about that. There's a lot of transfer portal guys. Uh, talking to my man, Gafir the Turtle. Um, looks like Maryland's about to make a couple of big recruiting splashes. I'll kind of leave it at that right now. They got uh, a couple guys that decommitted from some other schools that are going to be more than likely are going to be Terps, as has been reported across the board. And some of that helps coming on the defensive line, which is going to be big for Maryland. You need a better defensive line. You need a better offensive line. I'm going to say the one group that, that probably underperformed a little bit more so than others, it was obvious, the offensive line. And I know Ohio State's big. They were fast. Uh, but, I expect a little more out of that offensive yeah, line when they needed it. There's a lot of time to talk about that. Um, look, did they bring it? On Saturday? Yeah. I hope, man, I hope that they bring this. I, I Still not 100% convinced, but I will go more of a lean that, yes, Maryland will bring it. Rutgers gave their best quarter plus against Penn State and then got whacked 55-10. to 10. But they were in that game for a few minutes. And then Maryland comes out in front of not the biggest crowd Saturday oh, after Thanksgiving and puts up their 30, 32 points or so. Uh, you know, 32-17, 32-20, Maryland takes it. Yeah, I think it's time for the uh, good old beatdown of Rutgers, hopefully which will become finally a yearly tradition for Maryland football. Yeah, the Greg Schiano thing hasn't exactly worked out there uh, yet. They're better than they were, though. They are certainly better than they were. And I think Rutgers is really defeated that they could not get the six wins this year. And you know what? The offense may not always be good, but the defense of this team week in and week out has delivered. They didn't have their best game last weekend. They do this weekend. Rutgers, difference between Rutgers and Maryland, as much as I've judged Leah, is Rutgers absolutely does not have a quarterback. They play three quarterbacks a game. And look, we've had our fair share of years like that. It's a disaster. Look, look, before we close this out, and I know as usual we're running long, if Maryland's offense could, in the third quarter, would have gotten more than three and punt, three and punt, three and punt, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about how bad the defense was. The offense stranded them on the field. Well, really, there's 12 points that aren't accounted for. Well, the block kick. That's what I'm talking about. And the block kick and the fumble for a touchdown or interception. I don't yeah. even know. What was it ruled? Was it, it was a fumble. It, yeah, that was clearly a fumble. It was a fumble. So they gave up 14 points on uh, two plays that had nothing to do with. But still, the 17 points in that third quarter, once again, it was incumbent upon the offense to at least move the ball and help that defense out. Defense is good, but it can't do it all by itself. And and maybe no. well, I wasn't saying that. Th I said they had did not have their best game. Okay, it was definitely true. In the second half, they gave up like 120 rushing yards in the second half of the game. Yeah. And and that'll do you in. I, I got it. I think Maryland wins this one. Uh, give me Maryland 34, Rutgers 17. Is there a line? Not yet. I just checked. Yeah, I know. I was looking on DraftKings, which yep. had its early release today in Maryland. DraftKings. Hey, thanks to DraftKings for sponsoring the Young Terps podcast. We're proud to have you guys as a sponsor. And Mason will get to the spot a little later. So, Will, and I think it's time to uh, bring the basketball segment back to the show. So, Wayne, thanks for joining. Hey, and the basketball segment can be brought to you by Viner Four Gates. Your Terrapin source for IT. If you need help with your cybersecurity, and everybody these days does, give Viner Forgates a call. DC Metro phone number of 301 251 2900. Give us a call. We can help you out. Now over to basketball. It's that time of the year, and we're bringing back Jack Rothenberg, who has joined us again for Terp Talk basketball coverage. He's been out uh, at the games this year. And, um, Jack, well, I did not think the Kevin Willard era would start off right this way. As of noon-ish today, uh, the Terps are ranked. Yeah, they're ranked number 23 in the nation. I don't think really anyone saw this one coming. 5-0 and start. I believe, Mason, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first time anyone started 5-0 and in their first year tenure at Maryland, correct? Yeah, once Willard crossed the 4-0 line, he was the first Maryland coach in the history of the program, and there really haven't been that many Maryland basketball coaches to start off 4-0 and 
and obviously every game that he wins adds on to that number. But, yeah, I have to agree with you. Since we saw uh, Kevin Willard talk at the Babe Ruth Museum earlier before the season, it's, he said they were going to play fast. He said they were going to play hard. Emphasis on defense and three-point shooting. And, Jack, um, that seems to be rubbing off on uh, players both new and old. Yeah, definitely. I think coming into the season, we kind of knew that Dante Scott, Akeem Hart, like the the guys that were here last year that stayed were going to be the center of this squad. But a lot of others, uh, Julian Reese also in that mix, a lot of others pitching in. I think early in the season, uh, we we were focused on the defense and the shooting. The shooting wasn't looking as good as we thought it would be, especially in that Binghamton game early in the season. They were struggling from three-point range. But as we talked about over the weekend, the defense played well. The three-point shooting was activated again. Don Carey, I think, in my opinion, really showed the most from the three-point arc. Uh, he was he hit four threes in both games, and he showed the most improvement to me because early, if he wasn't hitting threes, he wasn't really providing much for this team. But over the weekend, he provided a lot from three-point range, and a lot of people were chipping in. Uh, Ian Martinez had double figures in that St. Louis game, I think, the Another thing, as you mentioned, the defensive pressure has been a big point of emphasis for this team. I think when they can provide the three-point shooting with the um, with the defensive pressure, it's it's big time, and you saw it on display this weekend. Yeah, and I think one of the big things to emphasize, Jack, is the Terps out-rebound both St. Louis and Miami. Uh, some numbers from the game against St. Louis, the Terps topped the Billikens 95-67. to Maryland shoots 32 for 63 from the field. That's 50%. Roughly, uh, the Terps 13 for 32 from three. They shoot 40% from three. Uh, they do miss 10 free throws, which which can really get you in a close game, but not when you're winning uh, by the kind of margin that Maryland was. They boat race St. Louis, who's a good team uh, in the first half. Both of these teams are still expected in the NCAA tournament. Jack, you mentioned it. Maryland, uh, big-time scores. Don Carey was 16 points for the Terps. Julian Reese, the only Maryland player that doesn't really score that much from the starting five. He only puts up four points, has a great bounce back game. But really this team is going to be judged on what they can get out of the bench players. That's Ian Martinez, Patrick Emelian, Jahari Long, uh, Noah Batchelor. You know, if Maryland can get a bench rotation going, the starting five on this team can compete in the Big Ten and it can compete nationally. Yeah, and you mentioned Dante Scott. He also he had a career high twenty five that St. Louis game. Backed it up in the game against Miami at twenty four. He obviously played very well. And I think, as you mentioned, one of the things that I was concerned about, at least early in the season when they were playing some of these kind of cupcake games, was was their size concern. Obviously, Julian Reese is their big man, but other than that, they're kind of small. They're big on the wings, but down low, they don't really match up with a lot of the big guys around around the country. So that was kind of my concern, but. If they're playing defense at this level and shooting the ball like they were this weekend, putting up that kind of points, I don't think it's going to be as big of an issue as we originally thought. And like you said, if this bench can can continue the the play once they they get to the bench after the first uh, first six seven minutes of the game, that's going to be the key for this team. And I, th- I think if they can keep it rolling, it'll be good. Yeah, I would agree with that. On to Sunday. Uh, the Terps get on ESPN, but uh, their game against Miami goes right up against the NFL 1 o'clock window. The Terps 88, Miami 70. Maryland, another great shooting performance. Really, really good ball rotation in this game, especially in the first half. Uh, carried on to closing time. Maryland with a bit of a rough patch at the end of the first half into the early second half. The Terps shoot 30 for 50 from the floor. That's 60%. 9 for 21. Another 40-plus percent three-point shooting game. 19 for 23 from the free throw line. Miami really struggled to shoot the long ball, 5 for 20 on the game from three. Uh, Maryland out-rebounds Miami Jack, 39 to 20 in this. Uh, the Terps basically beat Miami straight down the stat sheet. They do turn the ball over 18 times in this game, but hey, when you're scoring 88 points, uh, it's a lot easier to not look at that turnover number. Yeah, definitely, and I, I think a big point of emphasis from this game is every starter was in double figures. I mentioned Dante Scott. He had 24 in this game, led all scorers. But I think that when they're shooting like this, you talked about the 88 points. It doesn't really matter what kind of what kind of a uh, number you put up in the turnover uh, 
column. And they, like you said, they let up 70 points, but they didn't allow Miami to shoot the ball from deep very well, which I think is a big factor. If, if the, the other team is, is shooting very well, like Maryland did, it's going to be hard. Um, but yeah, two games this weekend, they shot over 50% from the field. That's obviously what you want to see. A big thing for me is going to, is going to be, can that defense hold up when they're not shooting this well? Because as we know, Maryland has those games where they can knock down shots. So it's going to be interesting to see moving forward if they can continue the focus and the pressure on defense when they're not shooting the ball this well. Yeah, and that's one of the things when you talked about uh, Kevin Willard coach teams, defense uh, and three-point shootings are three-point shooting is the mainstay of what he's going to tell this team to do. It, it is kind of his principles as a coach. We'll see how that carries on throughout the season. Uh, some numbers from the Miami game. Jack, you mentioned Dante Scott or Dante Scott, uh, the MVP of the tournament for the Terps, scores double figures both games, matches his career high in points both games. He puts up 24 points and eight rebounds for the Terps. Julian Reese has 17 points and seven rebounds. Hakeem Hart has 14 points and four rebounds. Uh, Carey with 12. Jameer Young scores 13. Terps don't need much off the bench. Only three players from Maryland's bench got in against Miami, being Emilian, Ian Martinez, and Jahari Long. Uh, all of those players getting around, you know, between 17 and 13 minutes in the game. So the short bench continues for the Terps. Uh, and now looking ahead, um, a Maryland legend will return to Xfinity Center on Friday night. Uh, Juan Dixon's Coppin State team, who's not, he's, he's done a lot to turn around Coppin State despite the uh, controversy around Juan uh, at this moment. Right, I think it's important for Maryland coming back home on Friday the day after Thanksgiving. Obviously, they should come out of that game with a win, but it's similar to other teams in other sports when you get up for a big big game, big couple games in this situation for Maryland, come out with a win. You don't want to have a letdown game against Coppin State, so I think shouldn't be too much of an issue, but Maryland needs to refocus, get everything back on track, and take care of business on Friday. Yes, they do. That game is at 4 o'clock uh, on Friday at Xfinity Center. Jack, will have another episode right around the Louisville game, but uh, it's looking like uh, the uh, – Basketball powerhouse at, at one point is is all but that this year. Louisville uh, having a awful season right now as we're recording this. They're having a better game, but they are losing to the number nine Arkansas Razorbacks, 41-33. to Yeah, they started the season off with three kind of brutal losses all by one point, last second kind of games, which isn't, isn't obviously great for them. Uh, and like I said, again, shouldn't be too much of an issue for Maryland based off the way Louisville has played thus far this season. But it's at Louisville. It's never a good place to go and play. Uh, it, it's going to be a tough game, grinded out ACC Big Ten Challenge. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to see how Maryland plays because it's just going to be interesting going forward. Now they're ranked the number 23 team in the nation. They're on kind of everyone's radar. They're not going to surprise anyone at this point. So it'll be interesting to see how they play that one. Yeah, and after that, the Terps a pair of Big Ten uh, midseason games against Illinois and Wisconsin. It's a tough stretch coming up for the Terps. Jack, we will be back uh, covering Maryland basketball from Xfinity Center on Friday. We missed the first couple games of the year due to scheduling conflicts. So, Jack, we'll see you on the post-game show from the court after the game against Coppin State on Friday. Definitely looking forward to it. And that wraps up this episode of the podcast. Everybody have a safe and great Thanksgiving, and we look forward to seeing you from Xfinity Center Friday after the game and on Saturday from CQ Stadium after the Terps take on Rutgers. And as always, thanks for listening.